You might have heard it said that a book in translation is a product of a dialogue between the author and the translator, but what do we say when a book actually contains dialogues between the actual author and the actual translator? And what do we say in the very particular case where that book is translated poetry? Bends the mind a bit, doesn't it? Well, your mind will continue to get bent, I suspect, in my conversation with Stephen Bradbury, who is the translator of Raised by Wolves by Amang. That is our book for this episode. It's poetry. Poetry is not really my home territory, so as always, it's interesting when I try and talk about it to a real expert, but I certainly gave it a go. So that'll be my, my chat and that'll be the meat in the sandwich that is this episode. But before we get to that lovely meaty filling, we're going to have the first piece of bread, the translated Chinese fiction news, the true true fig news. Now we have four items. We have a read, something to listen to, something my evil rivals are doing, and meta news, news about this, this podcast you're listening to right now. So we'll start with the reading. This is an interview between Tiffany Troy and the author Sean Koyi about a, a book that actually came up earlier on the show. I talked about this one on the Beijing Coma episode. Uh, so Sean Koyi wrote this novel called Death Fugue, which I think my elevator pitch would be if you liked Beijing Coma, you, you should like Death Fugue. So if you want to know more about that book from the mouth of the author, go check out Tiffany Troy's interview with her. Second news item, this is your listening, uh, although you'll, you'll soon see the third news item is also listening. It's a very podish news section today. So anyway, um, it's on the Seneca podcast. I know some of you listeners are also listeners of Kaiser Kuo's Seneca podcast. Well, he's interviewed someone who's still in my limelight, not really. Uh, he, he's interviewed Megan Walsh, who's written a book called The Subplot, What China is Reading. It's, I think, less than 100 pages. It's very short. And it's just a summary of what sort of genres are, what readers are into, and so on and so on inside uh, the PRC. So I think essentially if you're a fan of this podcast, especially the publishing side, but also the sort of trying to understand Chinese readership side, then this, this book's just perfect for you and it's a quick read. And I suppose if you can't even be bothered reading the book, then or you want to know a bit more about the book before you um, venture to adding it to your collection, then yeah, just listen to uh, Kaiser interviewing this lady because it'll sort of give you the rundown okay next item it's another podcast i've i've talked about these guys a few times i've had them on my show it's my fiendish rivals from the chinese literature podcast the two the two moors lee moore and rob moore they've they've been running a series uh on, on lu shun so uh, i think it's how many has it been now seven or something they've done quite a string of lu shun themed episodes with some amazing guests as well uh, i think the most recent one is with carolyn brown who wrote uh, a book about interpreting lu shun stories through the lens of carl jung's ideas i i'm shocked i've not read that book yet because that's a match made in heaven for me but yeah it's just it's the episodes are great i've listened to a lot of them uh just really solid interesting stuff what more can i say right fourth and final news item and I'm really rocketing through these today. Uh, I've been doing a lot of other stuff on my computer. I'm rather sick of it. That's <laughs> that's probably why I'm rocketing through them. But anyway, this is meta news. I'll try not to bang on about this one too long. But essentially, I've re revived a way for people to listen to or access this show inside the PRC without a VPN behind the GFWs. It's a lot of acronyms. Basically, um. The show, this show is hosted on Podbean, which is blocked by China's Great Firewall. Uh, we were hosted on Shimalaya, where, which, which is of course not blocked because that's the PRC's big podcasting platform. But I got kicked off uh, Shimalaya, I think because we were talking about Taiwan too much. I think that's what it was. Uh, but in any case, I found a, a, a website which is not blocked in the PRC, which it is possible to download files from, provided you're not in Chrome. Doesn't seem to work in Google Chrome. Uh, Safari does work. WeChat's browser, this may shock you to know, can't uh, can't get these files. But if you're in Safari, uh, there is a link. It's on the Trichifix site. Um, if you need it, you can message me by whatever means. 
um pass it on to your friends this is the vpn off way to get the show and uh yeah just let me know if you need that link but it is on the church of fix site uh on the bar down the right hand side so right i think that is all for me uh, as far as the news is concerned so now you're going to hear from me and my guest Stephen, talking about amans raised by wolves So on the show, we have Steve Bradbury, translator of Amangs, Raised by Wolves. Fantastic to have you here, Steve. Can you tell the listeners a wee bit about yourself? Well, I grew up in South Miami and I was very interested in art. I went to Cooper Union for a year, but then I dropped out because New York was a pretty tough place in the early 70s. I went back to Florida, bummed around, and um, I um, finally went up in San Francisco in the Hayda Ashbury district, actually. And I had fallen in love with Chinese poetry and Chinese art. And I wanted to learn how to do Chinese art. So I got this teacher in Japantown uh, who could teach me the, you know, Shan Shui Hua, the original, you know, kind of Chinese, what the Japanese call Sumie painting, landscape painting with, uh, you know, with the Chinese brush. Yeah. And he didn't speak any English and I couldn't speak a word of Japanese. So I went to San Francisco State University in the summer program and I took two semesters of Japanese. And my teacher said, you know, Steve, you're a pretty smart guy. You know, you should be going to school full time, you know, be a Japanese scholar or something like that. Uh, and I said, wow, that sounds great. And I was working as a night janitor anyway. So I enrolled in the fall uh, as a Japanese major. And because my teacher had told me that if I'm going to be a Japanese scholar, I need to learn Chinese. I also took Chinese 101. And by midterm, my Chinese was twice as good as my Japanese. And so I switched majors. And then when I graduated, I went to Taiwan at the recommendation of Howard Goldblatt, who was my qi meng lao shi, which means, you know, the, the, the teacher turns you on to something. And he turned me on to Chinese literature and, and the art of translation. And I knew I couldn't compete with Howard because he had already published some pretty powerful translations. And uh, so I thought, well, if I can't compete with him with fiction, I could do it with poetry. And uh, I always loved, always preferred poetry anyway. So I started, you know, memorizing uh, Tang Shi, you know, the Tang poems. And, and when I was in Taiwan, uh, by chance, I met a lot of really interesting people, um, you know, writers like Yuan Chong Chong and filmmakers like Yu Kanping. And I studied Chinese art. And um, then I thought, well, I could do the same thing. Like, okay, came pretty good, I think, after a couple of years there. And I loved living there. It was, it was wonderful. But I wanted to work on my Japanese. So I went to Japan and I wound up staying there for three and a half years. And uh, actually, it was so expensive back then that I became a commercial translator. Uh, my Japanese wasn't that good, but I could write. And so I did a lot of copy, copy editing, copy, copywriting and uh, translated film scenarios and uh, brochures and stuff like that. I made a heap of money. But I got kind of sick of Japan. So I thought, well, what could I do where I could still write? I could still translate. And I love to talk, probably aware. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, what could I do and, and come back to, to, to Taiwan? Because you know, I just love that place. So I thought, well, why not be, a, you know, um, a Chinese professor? So I went to, uh, to Hawaii at a time when the economy was really booming because of the Japanese investment in tourism. And the University of Hawaii uh, English department and Chinese department had both were well, just a wash in money. Uh, but I realized that you know if I got a d degree is in Chinese, I could never get a job in Taiwan because they're never going to hire a foreigner to teach teach Chinese. But they would right. hire me if I was an English teacher. So I I I got my master's in in Chinese, but then I switched to English and I got a master's and my PhD. And it was a great time to be a professor then because. The East Coast Center was also a wash in money, and I got uh, four years. They provided my, you know, paid for my tuition and housing. They gave me a stipend, and uh, and I had this wonderful advisor named Rob Wilson, who had spent time in Korea on a Fulbright, and he's the one who encouraged me to do a kind of comp lit English English dissertation, uh, English lit dissertation. So I wrote my dissertation on on uh, Ezra Pound and the. Uh, the the American poets of Pound's generation who translated Chinese poetry into English. And um, I did a really a cultural studies program where I showed the relationship between their approach to translation and, um, you know, an Amer what was really called, I guess, American capitalism, you know, the open door policy. And I showed the similarity between their division of labor, you know, where you find a an English informant or a text that glosses the original version. And then you, you add your ad, you know, value-added uh, editorial 
um, skills to that text, and then you publish it as if it were your own. The same way that Apple, you know, has all of its uh, products made in China, and yet you know people think of Apple as an American corporation. Right. So then I got a job uh, as a teacher at uh, one of the universities in in Taiwan, Zhongnan uh, Dashui um, National Central University in Zhongli, which is outside of Taipei. And I lived there for twenty years, and、uh, but I wanted to get back to art. And so I quit my job in 2015, and I've been in Florida ever since, mainly doing art. I mean, I'm still married to translation, but、uh, arts is what has really my passion now. That's my life in a nutshell. Awesome. I I kept thinking of follow up questions there because there's so many interesting thing rabbit holes that we could go down. Here's the one I'm choosing.、Um, so you mentioned Howard Goldblatt and Bing Bing Bing. Like when I was. Trying to amass a collection of translated Chinese、uh, books, but just before I started this podcast, that's a name that kept popping up that was impossible to ignore. And I guess anyone who's religiously listened to the show that hadn't heard of the guy before probably knows a bit more about him too. So I think a, th- a thing that、uh, I learned fairly early on is, although he's maybe if you like were to rank up all the big name translators, he's maybe still the king. He's also, I guess, later in his career and. Uh, young, younger and significantly younger translators are now popping up more and more in like the lineup of what's getting published. So I wanted to, and, and at some point down the line, you mentioned generations, and you you've told us、uh, an an amazing story there, where you've sort of been involved or you've seen translation the the I guess post war or late twentieth century through to twenty first century waves of translation of Chinese into English. Have you seen any interesting tr- trends and changes along the way? And are you interested in the new stuff that's getting put out there by younger translators? Do you see like significant differences? And this could be for Taiwan or mainland Chinese、um, poetry or prose or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think the the trend's a good one. There's just some really terrific translators out there right now. I mean, Jeremy Tiang, you know, who we interviewed, Kanan、mm. Morris is 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 just as good, I think. And、uh, you know, the, what the big difference I see between translation from Chinese at, at the time when I became first interested in Chinese poetry, which was the '70s. I remember the the moment exactly. I was I dropped out of Cooper. I was down in South Miami at this bookstore called Modern Times, which was on the second floor. And I was walking up the stairway, and at the top of the stairs was this this rack that New Directions、uh, ha- used used to give to bookstores as a kind of you know advertising promotional tool. And they would put all the New Direction books face out, so you could maybe there was twenty books on on the rack, and you could see them as you were coming up the stairs. And back then,、uh, Lachlan. Uh, James Lockman was still around. He、uh, he would hire these terrific designers,、uh, like one of them was David Ford, who did the covers for Kenneth Rex Ross、uh, books, and it was in fact one of、Kit、Rex Ross books that caught my eye. It was the cover of 100 Poems from the Chinese, and I,、um, you know, when I got to the stairs, I was I just blown away by the cover, and、uh, I opened it up and I read a couple of poems in there. I was blown away by the by the translations.、Uh, Snowstorm is one of them, and、uh, Um, let's see.、Uh, what was the other one、um, that really took my eye? Was、um, oh yeah, overlooking the desert. Yeah, Wang. And anyway, I, I read these poems and I fell in love with it. And I bought everything that Rex Ross、uh, was up that had Rex Ross's name on it. Hundred poems of the Japanese, hundred more poems of the Japanese, his、uh, poems in the Greek and all. And it really not only turned me on to poetry, but it turned me on to Chinese art. And that's how I, I, you know, I sort of fell in love with it because, you know, growing up in, in South Florida, which is a, it was a lovely it was a lovely place to grow up. But by the time I was ten or twelve, I was bored because suburban neighborhoods don't really have a, you know, it's really intellectually not very stimulating. And I remember sitting in in, in class and just in, in elementary school, we had this Rand McNally globe you know, with the embossed continents, the mountains, and stuff, and. And I used to—I was so bored. I used to spin that globe around and see what was on the other side of Miami. It was China. I never got to China, but I did get to Taiwan. So back then, you know,、uh, I, um, I I fell in love with Chinese poetry. But when I went to study Chinese, I was just absolutely、uh, flummoxed, flabbergasted that the Chinese poets did not write in free verse, and that later to find out that not only did、um, you know Chinese not write in free verse, but they wrote in Fixed rhyme and meter, much like the Victorian poetry. The po- you know, the free verse poets Rex Roth and Witterbinner, Amy Lowell, and of course Ezra Pound were st- sort of challenging with their free verse translations of of、um, 
of Chinese classical poetry. And I was also sort of surprised to find that none of these translators could read Chinese. I mean, they could stumble <laughs> through a dictionary like as Pound and Kenneth Rexroth, but they never bothered to learn, learn to read the language fluently, much less speak it. I mean, if you stuck a, you know, they, they couldn't tell the difference between a Chinese poem and a Chinese parking ticket. That's how, you know, um, in, in a sense, how ignorant they are of the, of the work they're translating, which is not to, I'm not criticizing people who, who, who don't study the language and translate, as long as they have a, you know, good informant or uh, a bilingual collaborant. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, I'm translating from Macedonian with a Macedonian uh, writer right now. In fact, we're running against the deadline, uh, Rumina Buzorovska. So it's not, not knowing the language, but having, having um, intelligent informants, I think is a, a, a absolutely crucial uh, to, uh, to a good translation, you know, combination of uh, bilingual Westerners and, and bilingual Chinese, but also, you know, reading some of the commentaries or at least understanding what they are. So in my, my generation was seven, you know, 60s and 70s, 80s, most of the translators, and still many of these people are around, don't know a word of Chinese. And they work either with collaborators or they work from pre-existing texts or they kind of collate it from, from various manuscripts. But what I'm seeing today uh, with uh, translators like, um, you know, Kate Morse, who I mentioned earlier, Jeremy Chang, and uh, let's see, uh, Jennifer Feely and uh, Lucas Klein, a lot of other translators, is they're really quite bilingual. And they're not only that, but bilingual, but they're bicultural in the sense that they live there long enough. They, they're very familiar with the culture out of which these texts emerge. And Howard Goldblatt was one of the first people to do that. I and mean, he was in the Navy, he wound up in Taiwan because, you know, we were still, we still had troops there. This is back in the, I guess, late 50s, early 60s. And he fell in love with the language and with the culture. Um, his Chinese is absolutely superb. I mean, he memorized so many things, all those idioms, the Chengyu and all that. Um, and so he was, I think, really the first and most fluent person to come along since the great 19th century translators like James Legg, you know, who, I mean, he's, he's the king of, his, king of us all. You know, he translated all the Confucian classics, was thoroughly uh, you know, knowledgeable about what he was doing. Uh, 19th century produced some terrific translators, early 20th century too. And many of them are Scots, you know, which is really quite interesting because of the missionary investment. So I really like the trend. What I'm seeing now is that people are coming up that, that uh, really know their stuff and, and they also can write. So I, I really like, I like the trend I'm seeing. That, that certainly sounds right to me. The, the idea that someone, a big, big name translator today could not have much firsthand knowledge of what life's like in China or Taiwan or be worse at sp speaking the language than me, that seems unthinkable. Which, and if, it's, if something is unthinkable, then obviously something has changed. So that's interesting. I, I guess I should keep us moving so we can actually get to the book we're here to talk about. It's Amang's Raised by Wolves. So first question I'll ask you about it is, is this a normal book of poetry in translation? Well, I hope not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a very unusual book. I don't know any book like this, at least you know, uh, as a as a vehicle for you know transmitting uh, Chinese language poetry into English. Um, I um, you know I've always felt that it's it's a, really a tough haul for a Chinese uh, poetry translator, especially of contemporary poetry. Um, and I thought, well, what, you know, what what could be um, you know, how could I package? The translations in a way that would make it more appealing to readers and also teach them something about Chinese poetry and Chinese language that you wouldn't get and culture that you wouldn't get from just reading the translations alone. Um, you know, the, the, it really came out of the, our conversation that we had at the Vermont Studio Center where we were both invited by, um, uh, we were invited there uh, through the Henry Luce uh, translation grant, which brings, I don't think it's around anymore, but it brings translators there for a month and they also bring the poets so that the poets and translators can, uh, you know, can can work together in the same physical space. And it was the most incredible experience. I mean, too often, I think poetry and translation is presented as if translation were this mirror image of the source text. And in fact, it's usually formatted that way, where you've got the Chinese uh, source text on one side and the English source um, uh, English translation on the other, as if they were, in fact, a mirror image. But, you know, translation is a messy business, and no translation is a mirror image of anything. But uh, I was also kind of prompted by the fact that, you know, I mean, Amon's poetry, you know, she's, um, 
like a lot of poets that I translate, she's really into wordplay and musicality and stuff. And, and work can be difficult. And I thought it'd be a, a way that we could talk about some of the complexity of, of the texts and also the difficulty of, of uh, translation in a way that wouldn't be footnotes or introduction or afterwards. It'd be a little bit more engaging. Um, and, uh, you know, it's funny, I was up there in the woods with her. She would always, I mean, it was our practice uh, to do the translations. I mean, I, I would do the translation in the evening, but it was our practice to talk them over in the afternoon after lunch. And we'd walk up to this wonderful hemlock forest up above Johnson, Vermont. And uh, we'd go up there with uh, wine and, 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 and fresh baked bread and cheese. And, you know, we'd talk about the translations or poems or whatever for an hour or so. And then she would do her thing. You know, she's a photographer, but she'd also uh, swim. I would swim. And, uh, and I just started doing landscape drawings when I was there. So uh, we just had a great time. We'd stay until the late afternoon and we'd walk back together. And, um, and anyway, I was so, uh, so fascinated by her personality and the conversations that we had um, since so many of them touched on topics that were relevant to the book, uh, either her source text, why she did something, you know, the, the meaning of a, a difficult phrase or whatever it was. I was so, she, um, the information was coming at me so fast that I started surreptitiously recording our conversations. <laughs> and, and then I thought, well, why not include some choice, t uh, choice tidbits from them uh, in the book itself? And she liked that idea. So, and so did our publisher. So that's what we wound up doing. Yeah, I've um, I've got a, a job where that involves quite a lot of recording conversations to put together articles and often recording just administrative meetings so that I can prove that I'm progressing towards so and so target. And it makes you it's a reminder that every in every conversation, if you're not recording it, the words are just vanishing into the wind. And it's a if you were if you're using a capitalist mindset, that's a terrible loss because lots of conversations have lots of amazing gems in them but yeah especially so if it's a translator and a writer discussing a translation it it as a, as a reader um reading reading raised by wolves i enjoyed sort of being a, a fly on the wall um for the, the sort of undramatic and the, and the dramatic clashes when you're trying to figure out who's whose preferred verb is going to come out on top it was pretty <laughs> enjoyable uh, yeah yeah i mean what was so great about it is that not, you know, I mean, being able to sit down with a poet and discuss, you know, a difficult passage uh, and be able to tell her, you know, what are the options for translating it in English? And because, you know, I mean, every every single choice that you make there's, entails some kind of loss or gain. And, but also you change things like register or the tone or the feeling, you know. And so I could go through a list of, of let's say, you know, for an adjective, I could go through the list of syn possible synonyms that I could say, well, this is erotic this de-eroticizes what may be originally erotic or this is um ambiguous this suggests you know a military register or a business register you know i could go through and explain the various options and i so i think being able to do that was uh you know in the same physical space was great because it made for a better translation and and recording the conversations enabled me to make sure that i missed something or misunderstand it because you know we were we were flipping back and forth between english and chinese i mean you know the sense would start in english and wind up in chinese or vice versa and and both of us speak very quickly so having the recording i could go home in the evening and 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 listen to exactly what she said and make sure i understood stood that so that when i made my revisions um, you know uh, they were good and i think this is really the key I think to translation is a lot of people think that when you get a, a nice rough draft, that's, you know, the translation is almost done. And then all you do is edit. But my feeling is that a rough draft is the beginning of the translation, not, not the, you know, not the midpoint or even, you know, it's, uh, it's really all about revision. What makes good work, any, any work, you know, anything good is, is that, um, you know, rethinking cycle that uh, revisionary uh, editing, um, you know, a uh, process that enables you to hone. And I mean, it makes the difference between, I think, you know, uh, a good translation and a polished one. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Um, when you were mentioning their connotations of different words, I, I recall that I didn't really enjoy high school English, especially not studying poetry until I realized it's essentially all just about connotations. Everything creates an impression in your brain that points your brain towards a certain feeling or idea. That was when I realized that, I realized it wasn't some 
logical system I hadn't I had to work out. Um, it was more that sort of associative logic. So speaking of connotations, um, what are the connotations contained inside Amang's poetry, or put more bluntly, like how would you describe it in a, in a nutshell? God, you know that is such a a troubling question. Um, this is the problem with labels: is uh, you know to call anything anything. To give it a label, impressionism or post-impressionism or you know, uh, fauvism or whatever, you know, it helps you categorize something and then put it on a shelf. But my feeling is, unless it's a consumer product um, or a book title, that you know, to put a label on any poem is, in a sense, to kind of kill it because you know, like all labels, it's like a conviction or a belief. Um, it gives you a, a false sense of confidence that you understand what this thing is. Uh, what makes it, you know, uh, what makes it what it is, it's hexicity, to borrow a phrase from Duns Scotus, you know, the, the thing that makes it what it is uh, and unique from every other thing. So I'm hesitant to, 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 to summarize what kind of poet she is for that reason. Because, you know, I think this is something that my, my poet Shai has always kind of pushed me to, to, to think about is that readers need their freedom and that's the freedom to interpret and, and make sense of whatever it is they're reading in a way that's meaningful for them. And so, uh, you know, my job is not to paraphrase what these poets are or what they do, but to, because, you know, once you do that, then they shut off and they stop thinking critically about what they're reading. You know, if you believe in, believe in God, you know, you're not going to question, uh, question, you know, you're not going to put that, that, that conviction through a recycle. I mean, a, a um, rethinking cycle and wonder, well, you know, is it really true? You're just going to fall into this sense of confidence, you know, this overconfidence, and you'll stop being curious about what it is you're doing. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to decline to answer that question. <laughs> All right. Okay. That's a very Among style move. If I'm remembering the dialogues in the book correctly. Um, uh, here's, yeah. here's how I'll, I'll approach this one then. Um, first piece of good news is I never did a single poetry module during my undergrad in English Lit. So although I know my genres, genre labels for film and for prose very well, I am a, quite an ignoramus when it comes to the sort of traditional labelings for poetry. And I'll bet a lot of the listeners are in the same boat as me. So I would never ask you, <laughs> for very practical reasons, I would not ask you to tell me what genre it is. Um, I won't even try and ask you to sort of say what she's what what sort of a poet she is. I was thinking maybe I'll ask you what is she doing or what's going on in Raised by Wolves, but instead I'll ask you a different question because uh, going on a slight tangent here, my girlfriend uh, last year or more than a year ago when I finished a PhD on wolves in Anglo-Saxon literature, oh, sorry, Old English literature and has been working on a couple of, well, one book about that and then another one down the road about actual wolves. So when I told her I was going to be doing a book for the podcast called Raised by Wolves, she said, ask the guest about the wolves. So I'll do that. <laughs> uh, what are the wolves in this book of poetry? Uh, what's going on there? Why is it called Raised by Wolves? Um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, e each each afternoon we would go further and further into the this hemlock forest. It was had this beautiful river running through it that um, eventually joined with the Kihon River, which was the river that flowed out of Eden in the Bible. I don't know if you're familiar with the Bible, but not that familiar. Uh, but she's, a, you know, she's a, a mountaineer, a nature girl. Um, and, uh, you know, she always wanted to go further and further into the, into the forest. So, each, you know, after a while, we actually almost at the source of the river, uh, you know, it's 40 minute walk up in there and then to go in the woods for another 20 minutes. Um, and she, she often went barefoot when she was there and, and, you know, all these hemlock seeds and, and ragged stones and stuff. And, and I said, you know, how do you walk around barefoot? And she said, cause I was raised by wolves. <laughs> and so I said, you know, you should write a poem about that subject. So she didn't write a poem when she was there. Uh, but when she was in Scotland, um, at a, uh, writer's residency she did and that's um that was the last thing that i translated in the book and when that was done i realized that the book was was done and so that's when we sent it off and it became the title poem for that uh yeah i mean one of the reasons why i i wanted to include the conversations is because 
you know, I think Amang is just this extraordinary human being. And, you know, I wanted readers to get to know this extraordinary woman as I have, you know, to get a glimpse of what makes her tick, you know, what compels her to write, you know, what uh, d- distinguishes her from, you know, everyone else. And, and I think the conversations help to do that. Um, the, I mean, the poetry gives some of her personality, but I think uh, the conversations help to flesh that out. Um, you know, she had a really hard scrabble childhood and a very difficult adolescence. And, um, uh, you know, she's, she's a tough character. She had to go through a lot of stuff and she really got her act together. Um, but there's still this wild side to her. And speaking of wolves, there are no wolves in Taiwan, but uh, uh, there are these, for her, a wolf is a kind of a, a symbol, you know, it's a demon. Uh, and uh, so the wolf that's there is, is in her imagination, in her mind. And I guess it's coming out of fairy tales, for example. Um, I think that one of the reasons why that uh, she wrote Raised by Wolves is she wanted to draw on that uh, kind of fairy tale, gr- Brothers Grimm kind of childhood that she had. As, as you were spelling that one out for me, I, it occurred to me that wolves are animals and something animals have in common with texts in the way you were describing them, in that it's best not to try and shove them into a nutshell. If, if you approach an animal directly and too quickly, the animal runs away. And similarly, if we rush into any kind of literature, I guess, especially poetry, the, me- the, the richness that's there, I was about to say meaning, but meaning is a... You know, that's a loaded term. The The wealth of what is in there or could be there in the poem will, will flee. But if you find a different path of approach, uh, zigzagging or very slow or indir- spiraling or something, you, you might get something in the end. So I'll ask you another very, a question that will help us approach things from an unexpected angle. What have nuclear, where, how do nuclear um, defense weapons programs pop up in this book? Well, she was staying um, at this writer's residency, which is, um, let's see if I can remember the name of it. Um, Cove Park, is that what it's called? I think Cove Park, Scotland. And um, the residency is on this, I think, inlet or a lake. And across from that is a nuclear power plant. And she was a photographer, among other things. She's a wonderful filmmaker, too. And so she would go down there to take photographs of uh, the waves and the you know, the, uh, the stones along the beach. And, uh, and then one day these security guards showed up and, and they made her erase the footage on the camera and told her she couldn't do this because, uh, you know, it was a security uh, problem. And that's how that came up in conversation. Yeah, because and one day I remember when I called her, it was we were, when she was in the residency, uh, almost every day we would talk for an hour about the translations as if we were in the same space. And, uh, and then she re- reprised that story of being stopped by the security guards. Yeah, it's it's a funny thing. Um, as you know, I've I've had a few conversations with people where they they tell me they've been shocked to learn that there are nuclear submarines off the west coast of Scotland. But it's true, the Britain has has a nuclear uh, program. It's all in nuclear submarines. They are. I think the idea is with nuclear submarines, they're under the oceans somewhere in the world, anywhere, anytime, but they dock and are repaired and are, the base camp is on the west coast of Scotland. And um, my family <laughs> has had some firsthand experience of them. Um, my uh, late granddad and my granny had a, a boat out there. They would go sailing around the west coast. And, you know, sometimes they'd be followed by dolphins or seals. Occasionally they'd see a big shadow there was a basking shark going under the boat but one time it wasn't a basking shark one time it was a sub and that means it's a nuclear sub so yeah these things are it's it's weird but they're very real and among has has been close to them as we learned in the story just just wanted to tell that tale it's i tell it any chance i can get i think we're ready to go to the next section that it's called dueling personas and we've already sort of hit on why it might be called that that there are dialogues between you, Steve, and Amang in the book, and some of them are sort of debates or, or uh, uh, arguments back and forth. Arguments in the sense of like a logical argument, not an angry argument, although they do get heated. Um, but aside from like that surface level, I want to ask a question about your persona as the translator, because it's not so often a translator will sort of feature so prominently in, in the thing that they've translated. So what is your 
persona as the translator in the book and your persona as the person as well? I think they're the same. I mean, uh, I am, you know, what I am and I was the way I was back then. Uh, you know, I, this is the first book in which I came, I took off my invisibility cloak uh, as uh, Lawrence Venuti likes to talk about the visibility of the translator. And I thought, well, you know, let's stop that. You know, uh, the reader needs to see that I'm there uh, and not just I'm on. And it, that was great. That was great fun to come out of my shell, so to speak. Um, and, um, you know, Amang is, uh, I mean, I, th I think uh, in one of the questions you sent me, you said, you know, that, that it looked, our exchanges seemed to be almost flirtatious. And uh, I wouldn't say that yet. they were, I wouldn't say they were exactly flirtatious so much as feisty. I mean, we both mm. are uh, very competitive linguistically speaking, and uh, we both love the kind of push and shove of a lot of the conversation. And, um, and Amang is an alpha female and like, um, you know, like a, 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 like a falcon and very intensely focused on what she wants. And, and she's very good at, um, you know, at pursuing that. Uh, I guess that's a, a comparison to the wolf is pursuing what she wants. Um, uh, whereas I think in, in the exchange, I'm a little bit more flexible than she is. But I really like the fact that she fought so hard for some of these uh, for some of the phrases in here, uh, I think uh, it made it a better book. It's that, that she brought me closer to the original text, or in some cases, I think, especially with the title poem, closer to the original feeling of the, of the book, how it reads and, and sounds to a Chinese speaker. So that was, that was great. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, there might be a bit of flirtation in, in our exchanges. Uh, and that's, I think it's, I mean, both have that kind of personality, but you know, it's funny, I've, I've known Amang for more than 10 years, and we spent six weeks together, four weeks up in Vermont, and then two weeks on the road together. We went to New York and came out of Florida because she wanted to swim in the freshwater springs we have here and on the beach. And, and, you know, I don't know a thing about her romantic life. You know, I, I, I think she has a boyfriend who's a climber, or possibly a photographer, but I don't really know. <laughs> so I probably know a lot about Amang, but I don't know anything about that side of her, really. Right, yeah. I wanted to... Um... I explain what I meant a bit more there because although it, it's definitely true there's a lot of technical discussion uh, in those dialogue sections between the poems your personalities are there as well and a thing I noticed about well, I think I noticed about the poems is not all of them at all but many times in Raised by Wolves there's you know is sexual stuff there and both you and Amang were able to talk about it very frankly and sometimes make jokes about it and I guess the, the thing that made me think of is that it's, these aren't just technical discussions. There's some flares of personality there. And among struck me as, yeah, like you said, kind of a feisty, strong-willed character. How do you feel, how do you feel you come across? I felt that you, your personality was a little bit more invisible, that, um, that you, that you weren't more just were serving as the translator, but did you feel any of your own self features there through, through the personality that's imbued into the words? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think I have a fairly big personality. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not a wallflower by any means. But, you know, the book is about, uh, is about Amang. Uh, yeah. I wanted a portrait of her in addition to the, to the poems. But I think there's, there's quite a bit of me there. I think you can sort of see, you know, my, my conversational style, my, uh, I'd like to say my sense of humor. Yeah, <laughs> I hope totally. I have a sense of humor. It was and, a funny um, book at many points, mostly yeah, because of the dialogue. Uh, and, and I think that's, that helps you know, humor is a wonderful thing because it helps to d disarm people and, and make them relax. And I think that's very crucial to, to any frank discussion of any subject is they have to feel confident that that uh, I'm not going to, you know, take the information that they give me and use it in any destructive way. Uh, I have, I think uh, of all the translators I know, I think I probably have the closest relationships with my, my authors. I mean, I, they're all close friends. We work very closely and we stay in touch and I'm not just their translator, but I also try and, you know, help promote their work and, um, you know, uh, I let them bend, bend my ear. When I lived in Taiwan, I was always getting together with, you know, one or, one or more of my authors and, you know, we get together for drinks at a bar someplace or a coffee a house or whatever and talk for hours, not just about the translations and their poetry, but, you know, I mean, um, we're, we're, we've all been close friends and we've remained in touch ever since. Um, all of them, really. The feeling of like a network and the, the life of poets and people in, involved in literature is, is totally there in the book. Um, so I, I mentioned, I haven't 
I didn't give this question to you in my prepared sheet, but it occurs to me there's not a whole lot of questions here about just like what's the content of the book. So I think I should I should throw one in here about that. So I mentioned that there's a fair amount in the book that is um, looking at like love lives or or more directly sexual stuff, but that's far from like all that's there. You also mentioned there's some uh, it touches on like a little bit of a rough scrabble childhood, but like what other topics or, or themes is the book hitting on? Ho- hopefully this isn't too much of a label, but just so the listeners have an idea of what's in here. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, 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 not at all. I mean, she has very, very, uh, I'd say maybe half a dozen big areas that she's interested in writing poetry about. One of them is, is, is language, um, you know, the complexity and the richness and the playfulness of language. Another is technology. I mean, she's got several several poems in there that I translated. Uh, she's written a lot more uh, than the ones I have in here on uh, on on technology. You know, the the um, the influence and nature of, uh, for example, social media and uh, digitalization. And, uh, and then she has a lot of poems about nature, about about her life, her personal life. Uh, especially her family background, uh, and then poems about Taiwan. Um, yeah, I mean, her, her, her range of, of topics is, is quite interesting, I think, because I'm interested in all those subjects as well. Yeah, right. Okay, so that, that's a good, good um, bone to throw the listeners there who maybe haven't read the book. Um, I'd like to springboard from that onto, um, in quote marks, national identities. Um, so we, we mentioned when in the early parts of our chat, uh, lots of, you know, we were bringing up mainland China, Chinese literature, but also Taiwan, Taiwanese poetry, and so on and so on. And as I was reading through the book, uh, in your, I, f- I think, it, to be honest, I remember the dialogues more than I remember the poems. And a disclaimer, I read this one a wee while ago, uh, mostly on the train going from Knutsford, where I am in Cheshire, to Manchester. It was, it felt like a good, a good book to, to read on the train for some reason. But anyway, um, yes, in, in your back and forth, she was often... S- I remember she would bring up like there's this so-and-so thing that you need to understand about being Chinese or this thing has a has a context in Chinese and that it, I, I didn't do a count or a tally but I felt that those instances of um, discussing things as Chinese seem to either stick out more to me or outnumber the question of things being Taiwanese, Taiwanese identity or Taiwanese context. Um, so I don't know if that was I, I really, I wouldn't know how to frame that other than to say, as a Scottish person, I can sort of relate here because depending on the conversation I'm having, uh, sometimes it's more relevant for me to talk about whatever question from my position as being a Scottish person. And sometimes if I'm being honest with myself, it's more relevant to be talking about it from the perspective of a British person or, or a UK citizen. Um, so, you know, whatever preference I have in that identity might be outweighed with what's more relevant to the conversation. So, all of that is to ask you, do you think if we were to, I know these are labels, so feel free to poo-poo them, but like if we were to slap Taiwanese, Chinese, Taiwanese literature, uh, chi- uh, Chinese literature, Taiwanese poetry, Chinese poetry onto the book, are those relevant at all? Or um, are they just sort of circumstantial and not worth that much attention? Well, that's really a brilliant ob- observation, Angus. Um, you know, in the context of our duel over how to translate something. Um, it was, it's natural for her to, to, to use the term Chinese because she's using Chinese mm. to describe the language that she's, you know, Mandarin, the, the language that we're, she's writing in and the language that we're, we're speaking in our conversation. I mean, and this brings us to, up to the, you know, the, the point that there's this incredible impoverishment in English of words to express the complexity of what it means to be Chinese. I mean, in English, we have like one word for the whole lexicon of terms that, you know, to describe the many facets of being Chinese, you know, political, linguistic, social, cultural, you know, just think about all the Chinese terms, uh, words there are just to describe the language. Just, you know, all these terms are there available to them to... Uh, to, to describe something uh, that we inevitably turn into the single, you know, noun or adjective Chinese. And same thing with people, you know, Zhongguo Ren, Taiwan Ren, Taipei Ren, you know, Bunsheng Ren, Waisheng, Han Ren, Hua Ren, Hua Chao, Wei Chao, you know, just goes on and on and on. 
And, uh, you know, so, so in, in English translation, when she's saying Chinese, uh, often what she's meaning is, you know, Hua Yu, you know, the Chinese mm. language or Zhongguo uh, Wanghua, you know, or Chinese culture, or, uh, and she's not talking about nationality. I mean, the whole subject of, you know, nationality, I think is kind of, you know, absurd when you're talking about poetry. Poetry is international. That's what makes it so interesting. It, there's yeah. no border that can contain a poem, you know, it, it, it's, it's transcendental. But she is very Taiwanese in the sense that, you know, she loves Taiwan and, um, you know, she sees herself primarily as a Taiwanese person. Uh, rather than a Chinese person, uh, in the sense that, you know, she's a bunch on her parents were Taiwanese, she spoke Taiwanese at home. And uh, it wasn't until she went to school that she started using Mandarin. Uh, and, you know, uh, she de deeply identifies with uh, the notion of Chinese cultural tradition, you know, the going back to the Confucian classics and, and all. Um, so um, I don't know if, if that answers your question or not. Yeah, I think that's the common sense answer I, I was expecting. I mean, to your point, here we are speaking in English. Neither of us are English. So if listeners can't yeah. get their heads around that, I, I don't think I can help them anymore. Yeah. Uh, my dad was a Canadian. He was Black Irish Canadian. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> but I guess his parents eventually originally came from England. And my mom was a Norwegian American. So I've never quite felt you know, like I was exactly an American. I grew up in America. You know, I live here now, but uh, I, I just think, you know, I mean, I guess I'm patriotic to some extent, but, you know, just the idea of nationality, that whole notion of a nation just, you know, I grew up with uh, the, the idea of a, of a global village, you know, and I, I think it's one of the reasons why I was drawn to translation and art is because they, they, they recognize no borders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. Um, speaking of poetry crossing borders, so rather than looking for genre labels, how about sort of uh, aesthetics or movements? Is it vagabondish poetry? Is it punk? Is it hippie? Is it beat? Like I'm, I'm reaching for sort of rebellious, uh, disobedient movements here. Do you think there's something to that? Or am I foolishly yeah. slapping yeah. on yeah. American Yeah, I mean, just keep adding stuff? more and more words. And then <laughs> the more you add, I think the closer you'll get to her. Audacious, pugnacious, uh, contentious, uh, uh, divisive, uh, uh, embracive, uh, in your face. Yeah. I think in your face would be a, she, I think her, her poetry is very much in your face, even as she turns and goes on, you know, to something else. Uh, yeah, she's, she was raised by wolves. Okay. And on a technical level, uh, what makes it in your face? Well, I think, uh, one of the things she does is, which the, my other poet Shari does is, is sometimes she, she kind of flirts with the reader, I think, uh, or says something, you know, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's a little bit, you know, it's, it's not rude so much as, uh, wow, you know, come out of your shell. I'm, uh, uh, and, you know, and, um, yeah, she's, she's not one to, um, you know, she, she throws a good left punch. You know, the one is her, her willingness to talk about a lot of topics that, um, you know, that, that many people would not talk about, like, you know, like the poem Trash, I think, sort of gives a sense of that, you know, genre and her discussion about, about um, you know, her, her anger at the way that, that uh, you know, misogyny, for example, just overwhelms women and, and uh, you know, the need to sort of resist this homogenization that capitalism has imposed on everything and, uh, you know, uh, um, and then institutions like marriage, for example, you know, and uh, yeah, she could, she could, she, she's angry about a lot of stuff, I think, because it constrains women or constrains people. And um, so and she's, I think, you know, as socially and politically, she's, she's contentious and, and I think uh, beautifully so. Right. And is that typical among her peers or her generation of uh, poets? I mean, I mean, I know we just, trash no, the idea no, of I don't nations so. but like do other young or i say young do other um taiwanese poets her from her sort of generation or wave do similar stuff uh, no i don't i mean the poets that uh, that i translate um they're all very different for one thing mm. and i think the, the other poet who who uh of her generation who is in that sense culturally and politically um you know um spicy Spi spicy and and uh and you know it's is a resistance poet you could say is hong hong who was in fact her publisher published her last book uh and he's he's a really ter terrific poet um i've translated a few of his works yeah he's 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 
he used to run, and I'm not sure it's still around or not, but he used to run the Taipei International Poetry Festival. He's also a filmmaker and theater director, and but he's very political. And I think that's the, the, the poet out there who, who has most in common with Among in terms of their, their relationship to, to society. But their poems are very different. Their styles are very different. Okay, excellent. Um, so we were talking a bit about, or you, you mentioned some specific poems here. I wonder, uh, since we have a bilingual book here, if we could read a few verses or a whole poem in the Chinese and the English. Um, is there any one, if you could pick one, that would be a favorite for listeners to hear, either in part or in full? Well, my favorite is the title poem, which I just think is brilliant. It, it, I think it's the clearest uh, portrait of her personality, but also of her background. So I, that's, the, that's the poem I'd like to read, if you don't mind. All right, then I leave it in your hands. Okay. Lang Yang De. Sangue. 爸妈没有下山那是我可惜羊还有我最爱吃的海鱼祖母又升起炉火忙碌起来树上猴子跳来跳去一匹野马冲破了墙那是我狼养的 I very much like how you pronounce the title that's wonderful Raised by Wolves Three months had passed and Ma and Pa had not come down the mountain. The local grocery would no longer honor our IOUs. I hadn't the strength to run or climb a tree. Granny led me to the water to drink my fill. Then it came. I'm very small. I reach for the sky as I wobble back and forth, a child just learning how to stagger. Reflected in its eye, embraced by clouds in the sky, that's me. From its mountain lair it came bounding down to the gravelly shore, setting land and sea on fire, making Granny's bed boil and seethe. I hear them going at it all night long. But then I fall asleep and wake to find heaped at my feet freshly slaughtered chicken and sheep and all the fish I love to eat. Granny is bustling round the fire. A monkey is leaping from tree to tree. A mustang busting through the wall. That's me. Raised by wolves. Brilliant. Um, I guess we saw some of the in your in your face style there. Uh, as as a translator, I meant to ask you this question earlier. But as as a translator, what do you do? What did you do to get that in your face style across in English? Because Chinese and English, you can see just from looking on the page, they they just work really quite differently. So how do you how do you get the the vibe across? Well, um, I kind of translate by the ear. My, my, when I think about translation, there's so many different kinds of translation and, and you not only have to think about, you know, who your reader is, but you know, what is the purpose of your translation? What is it you're, uh, what do you expect to do with it? And, you know, books don't sell very much in bookstores anymore, but uh, I um, sort of feel that my biggest selling point is how they read aloud. So my, my primary uh, audience is my poet. And by chance, the three poets I'm still translating are both fairly bilingual. And I it's, make sure that I please them because I'm, I'm there to represent them. But my other goal is to make it so that it's enjoyable to read aloud when I go to a conference or have a poetry reading you know, at a translation conference or a poetry workshop or whatever it is. And I like to perform. And so do my poets. You know, when they read, it's not just a reading, it's a performance. 
And so I kind of feel that I have to not only be accurate to my source text, and I have to represent that source text in, in, a, in a realistic and, and accurate way, but I also have to create a similar impression, that, a general impression. And in the original, it's, it's, very, it's very musical. It's almost like you know, the, the style of it, it's register echoes, um, you know, nursery rhymes and uh, playground songs and, and fairy tales. And, and I wanted to do that as well as in English. So the first thing I usually do when I'm translating a poem is I memorize it, and, you know, memorize the original so that I can get a feel of how it, how it comes across. And then of course, I always ask my authors to, to read it aloud as well. So I get some idea of how, how they're doing it. And then I think about well, how, what can I do to make it come across like that as well. There's always, of course, there's loss and, and, and gain in this process because their fairy tales are different than ours. And there, there's, there's always, there was always some difference between the two versions. But, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why my poets really like me and they want me to continue to translate their work is because uh, I, I strive for this effect. I don't just try and put something down on a page. Yeah, um, on this podcast, uh, I've mostly looked at prose short short stories and novels generally speaking so when i've had translators on that's usually what they've handled and that's what we talk about i have had a few translators of 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 poetry on but really not so many and i think what you've really underlined for me there is what a massively different ball game uh translating poetry chinese to english is or should be uh compared with translating prose like (laughs) you couldn't really do that for a novel memorize the whole thing or hear the, the, the author of the novel read the whole thing. Uh, that would be silly. So yeah, it, I, I had not really thought about it, but now you've s- described it, it's so obvious how what a different affair it is translating prose and poetry. Well, I beg to differ with you, Angus. Uh, go, go for it. Um, you know, I don't really think that there's any difference between poetry and prose, or any significant difference. I think prose writers use the same techniques and strategies. I mean, good prose writers, you know, Virgi- you know the Virginia Woolfs, the Scott Moncriefs, you know, the um, T.S. Eliot's and, and Marcel Proust. And, you know, they're, they're using the same poetic techniques as the poets are. And if you read their work aloud, you, you, you discover that. And I learned this from uh, a very interesting Scottish translator, Alistair Reed. And you know him, uh, his work? Don't think so. I might have heard the name, but if I have, well, you I need to write I've this down it. because Alistair Reed is one of the great <laughs> translators of the modern of the post-war era. He was a, a protege of Robert Graves, and in fact, he lived with Robert Graves in Majorca for a while, and then he ran off with Graves' girlfriend, uh, and, and Graves never forgave him. But he was the Borges' first English translator. Oh um, right, and he also Neruda's, and uh, he was a marvelous man, and. I had Wait, the pleasure. So did, of, can I jump in there? Did he translate from Chinese at all, or from? Not no, 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 no. He translated from Spanish. Oh, that's why I don't know him. I'm, I'm completely clueless uh, for any yes, other Yes, you language. need to look him up. He's the most amazing guy. He's a wonderful poet in his own right. He's a fabulous translator, one of the greats. But he was also a terrific travel writer. He worked for many years for the, uh, the New Yorker, and uh, he lived in the Greenwich Village. And, and you know, this is kind of interesting uh, history, I think. Uh, the first uh, conference of the American Literary Translators Association, which I, b- I belonged to since 1999, was in New York City. And by sheer coincidence, I j- I'd j- just been hired and I was working on my first book, uh, which was a uh, translation of Shayu's, uh, a sampler of Shayu's poetry called Fusion Kitsch. And the, there were two keynote speakers at the conference in New York. And one of them was uh, Howard Goldblatt, who you know, who remembered me, we'd sort of stayed in touch. And uh, he helped me get my first, uh, uh, connected with my first publishers Zephyr Press, which published uh, several of my books. And uh, the other keynote speaker was Alistair Reed. And, you know, I wanted to interview him for a, a Chinese language cultural studies journal. And so I had contacted him prior to the event. And I said, you know, I, I really admire your work. I've been reading it, you know, since the early seventies. And, you know, uh, could I interview you for this journal? He said, yeah. So after his keynote speech, speech we went down to the village and then i spent two days with him in greenwich village watching him drink pitcher after pitcher of beer i never saw anybody (laughs) drink so much and still remain sober as he talked about everything under the sun it was the most amazing thing and one of the things he said is you know see there really isn't a difference between prose and poetry and i've been thinking about that ever since and uh 
I mean, this is something that I don't know if you if you're familiar with uh, stylistics, which is the linguist's version of literary criticism, and they analyze um, you know literary texts uh, in terms of their seven language levels, you know, morphology, graph, uh, graphology, uh, semantics, context, uh, whatever, and they basically say, you know, you know. We should look at all texts as, as, in a sense, being poetic. And it was really a huge revelation for me as a literary scholar and a teacher is to, you know, reading the, a book like To the Lighthouse and see, you know, all the musicality in there, um, the internal rhymes and the cadence and the rhythms. I mean, her work is as poetic as T.S. Eliot's. Does that not work a little less effectively outside of literary, formal literary fiction, though? Like, what about a wuxia web novel or a, a boy love yeah, web novel? Yeah, I mean, novel? well, like, you know, some people have much better ears than other people. Some people have a, a tin ear, the wooden ear. But, you know, I think they, they uh, strive for that. You know, we really see a lot of poetry, I think, is in advertising slogans and in sports announcers, you know, right, the titles yeah. to essays. Copywriters. Uh, you know, they're almost always a pun and there's always some internal rhyme in there or they're alluding to some um, historical phrase or idiom or whatever. I mean, I think this is one of the problems for, for many of the poets of the pa- uh, many of the translators in the past is, and it's not true, I think, for the younger translators coming up who, many of them who, like Lucas, for example, he went to high school in China. So he's, 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 he's got, you know, a lot of the culture in him is the absence of a childhood in, in the language you're translating from. You know, I mean, Eliot has that term, uh, what does he call it? A auditory imagination, which is if you grew up with a language, it's in your culture and in your in your ear. If you hear it before you you see it, the, its relationship to you is very different than, than reading something off the page for the first time. Uh, you know, because language reaches down not only into the you know very deep layers below your conscious uh, levels of thought and feeling, but they also reach out into the culture at large, subtle texts and context. And I'll give you an example of that. The, I remember going to this, uh, again, it was the American Literary Translators Association conference. It was in a different town. And there was this medieval translator named Dorothy Gilbert, who uh, was reciting at this event we called Declamacion, where you have to memorize, you know, either a, a source text in a foreign language or memorize an English translation of it. And then you perform it in front of all these translators. You're not allowed to read, a, have a crib sheet or anything like that. And she started to recite the opening lines to Chaucer's, you know, prologue to the Canterbury Tales, and you know, which goes, uh, "When that opera with his shoulders sought the drock, the march had person to the road." And she know, sooner got to that second line than you know, like half the people in the audience uh, began reciting the the Middle English with her. It was the most amazing thing to see, including me. And the reason was because, you know, all of us were forced to memorize the first 16 lines or so when we were either in high school or in college. I mean, this is a while ago. I don't think they do this anymore. But uh, and it was it was phenomenal to see everybody because it's in it's hardwired in their muscle memory. And then, you know, when things are that way, then they are hardwired in your memory because you have a childhood in the language. Then when you, you know, like when when I hear the opening lines to, uh, you know, like, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, you know, which kind of echoes uh, Chaucer's line, you know, what um, April is the coolest month, breeding lilacs in the dead land. You know, I'm not only hearing Eliot's voice, but I'm also hearing, hearing echoes of Chaucer, but also of, you know, Whitman's when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed. So, you know, that's, that's that kind of richness of, of uh, you know, the orality um, and the musicality of the language. And I think that's what you know, many translators, you know, prior to the new generation miss. Someone like Jeremy Tang, who grew up in a bilingual, you know, educational system, he has it all. It's all up there in his head. And so his his understanding of the associative networks of text is very, very rich. And I think it's true also for several other translators as well. I'm sorry, I think I went on forever. <laughs> right. <laughs> We, we've, we've wandered down a path here to, to new territory. I was just thinking what's hardwired in my brain from my literary childhood. It's probably um, the voice of Stephen Fry reading the Harry Potter audiobooks. I wasn't, oh, yeah. wasn't really reading Chaucer as a kid. What an incredible, I mean, he's so learned. You know, uh, did you ever read his book on, 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 on the Greek poets? Oh, I've, just... I've read precisely zero Stephen Fry books. Oh, you should. He's, he's, he's quite brilliant, actually. Yeah, no, he's he's an interesting fellow. He's definitely definitely made for a vocal medium. Um, speaking of uh, 
vocal mediums, uh, dialogues, can I tempt you to read one of you and you and Amang's dialogues, um, or would you rather not? Shall I start? Okay, so what, what, let's clear up what we're doing here. Are you going to read your your um, parts, and then I'll be Amang? I'll just why don't I just do both? Yeah, I, go I have for a it. Voice in my head. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I'm asking you this question about uh, uh, one of her poems. And I have a question, Amon. Why all the periods in that long list of appliances and garbage and stuff? And she replies, to slow the reader down, to isolate the words. Each one of those things has its cache of secrets, a source of mystery that deserves individual attention. I thought you were a poetry teacher. I'll pretend you didn't say that. Why the reference to minus 17 degrees Celsius? She's talking about the poem GPS. Because that's the coldest you can make a freezer go. Really, I didn't know that. You should read more science, Steve. <laughs> I'm too busy cleaning up your garbage. Speaking of which, you sure write a lot of poems about garbage. And then she replies, it's everywhere. You can't get away from it. Finish trash. Trash being the title of a, uh, the poem, Jan Ren. Now, Jan Ren is, uh, then we have this uh, discussion of, the, of, um, of that poem and the difficulty of translating it. Okay. Okay. So then, um, so then I, I come up with, uh, with uh, the translation of that poem, which I call Trash. And she says, I like it. I'm glad you do, because, but I got to tell you, I'm still a little confused. She says, uh, about what? And I say, time, the great leveler, about why you find time so sexy. That's one of the things she says in the, in the, in the poem Trash. And she replies, because it's mysterious. Mysterious things are always sexy because you don't know what they are or what they're capable of like a good looking guy you meet in a bar, like those fragments of Greek and Roman statues you find in museums. You can't quite believe in them, but you can't help admiring them because they're so beautiful and ancient. At the same time, I hate time. I hate all those big abstractions like social harmony, family, marriage. Most of these ideas are only made by pen, men to enslave women anyway, and men themselves too. Like the idea that you can only love one person, have to love them forever. Forever is bullshit. There's only the present. Come out of your shell, Amon. I say, I'm not joking, Steve. Ideas like this make me wish I lived in prehistoric times before the invented time. The problem is if you only live in the present, you're little more than an animal. And I say, aren't you contradicting yourself? Of course I contradict myself, Steve, I'm a poet. You sound like Walt Whitman. And she says, I don't sound like anyone else. But what you say is a contradiction, you know that, right? I don't know anything of the sort. Look, Amon, first you say that time is sexy and exciting, then it turn, that it turns you on, and now you're telling me that you hate society, that it's basically a form of power designed to enslave, and she cuts me off. That's not a contradiction, Steve. That's how power works. It's because these bullshit ideas are so sexy that we allow ourselves to be enslaved, and that's why in the poem I invite other women, men too, to get trashy, to do all the things that embarrass people to, in power, to ignore all the rules about how you should act. It's the one form of resistance they really don't know how to deal with, to laugh in their face. So that's, uh, that's uh, that, our conversation. <laughs> anyway, you can see her personality. She gets pretty intense sometimes. Yeah. But it's, it's great fun. You know, I'm, I mean, we don't really have arguments. We have, we have more or less understandings that are very um, pugnacious. <laughs> They're dialectically reached, I guess, back yes. and forth. Yeah. Um, so we had some interesting keywords there which leads me quite nicely to the next question. First in our miscellaneous section, the fun section, um, it's a word of the day. Could you suggest a Chinese word of the day for this book? Yeah, well, I think the title, you know, Lang Yang, Raised by Wolves. Lang is the Chinese word for wolf, and Yang is the Chinese word for to be raised by. So Lang Yang. The Marching swiftly on to our next fun question, which piece of music uh, would you pair with this text, Raised by Wolves? If you could pick from any in the world, which would it be? Yeah, a good question. I don't know if you remember um, reference to Lisa in the uh, dialogue, in the conversation. She comes up several times because she's a translator from Spanish, uh, my best friend and a translator from Spanish. In fact, she won the National Translation Award for her translation of a collection of poems by the great, late great uh, Argentinian poet Juan Gelman. Uh, and uh, we've been friends. Uh, we met at Alta. We've been friends for 15 years. And we always run our translations by each other because she doesn't know any Chinese and my Spanish is very minimal. 
and we give each other kind of our editorial feedback. And, and so I, I don't publish a word that I don't send by her, you know, to get her feedback on and, and she's the same. But she's also a wonderful musician who around 2013, 2014, started uh, composing her own, her own songs. And she just came out with a new CD, her first CD called Awake, which uh, is really quite wonderful. She's, uh, I guess she, if you had to put a label on her, uh, it would be alternative folk, but uh, that doesn't quite cover either uh, Bossa Nova, but also, um, I mean, she's, her work is really quite unique. Um, and anyway, uh, she had a couple of videos that go with this thing that you can find on her website. And one of them was made by Amon because Amon isn't just a poet. Oh. She's a wonderful poetry video maker. And in fact, she's made quite a few uh, videos for poems that were included in the, in the book. And it's really sad that, that uh, somehow we weren't able to, to include the videos in, in the package, in the book package maybe with the QR code that would take you to a link. Uh, and anyway, she did this, uh, this wonderful video for, for Lisa of a song that's on our CD called Hook and Eye. I don't know if you hook. know what a hook and eye is. Hook it's, and uh, eye. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a lock. You find it on clothing, like a button, for example, with a loophole, that's a hook and eye, but you also see a lot of it in Salem. Day is dawn, lightness is calling. Such a lovely haze A while I'm long and rains begin falling Washing me away What a way to start the day Waking to goodbye So damn hard to walk away When you're hook and I Hook and I and right. it's used as a metaphor for relationships. And she made this wonderful video for that wonderful song. And I'd love to send you the link and have you post it with, uh, with, with the podcast, because I think people would really enjoy seeing uh, not only Among's video, but uh, listening to Lisa's uh, music. And she not only writes the songs, but she plays them and uh, sings them herself. No, that sounds excellent. Um, what I always do is through the magic of editing, I put about 30 seconds or a little bit more of whatever song we've named into the episode. So that will be cleverly edited in here somehow. Yeah. I mean, I think Amang is one of the best filmmakers I've ever, I've ever met. And, uh, and, I, and I do the subtitles for her, her films in, in English. She's got quite a few things up in Vimeo. Uh, but she's oh, yeah. really, she's really a, a phenomenal filmmaker. Just, uh, and that's, yeah. Um, and so is Yemi Me. They both make films. Oh, nice. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get, make sure there's a link to the video as well as, um, well, maybe that'll serve for the song, uh, the song link as well. But yeah, that'll definitely be there in the show notes. I'll, I'll share my choice as well. Uh, this one is, not quite as closely connected with the text, I suppose. I can't trump you there. The song is called Potty. Uh, sorry, the song is called The Gap. It's by a band called Potty Mouth. I think they're all female. Certainly, the finger singer is female. Um, they're kind of punky, kind of spiky, but it's not like mega loud. It's not mega fast. It's got a little bit of um, I don't know if aloof or disinterested is the right word or just fatigued. But it's the general sound of this song is. I'm imagining someone who's having a go at me and is sick of my shit. And um, it's, <laughs> it's, an in your, it's in your face, but it's not loud, if that makes sense. So I figured that was the best, the best pairing I could think of from my own little <laughs> internal library. Well, I look forward to listening to it. be stitched in here um, for for your listening pleasure 
And my next question, now this is a bonus question. This will be stitched out of this main episode and will be going up to the Translated Chinese Fiction's Patreon feed. So uh, that's that's where listeners can go find this one. This is a, a big question. Hopefully you're up for this one. Who, in your, your very own opinion, would you say are the greats, could be modern, could be classical, of Chinese language poetry? Yeah, no, I had very early bedtimes as a young kid, and it wasn't actually possible. I thought I had a sleeping problem, but actually, I just wasn't tired. <laughs> so I, yeah. I, they bought me s- sprays to help me sleep, but it's like, no, I just need to be a little bit more nocturnal, because... Yeah, if you're not tired, then you're not ready to fall asleep unless, unless there really is a problem. So yeah, um, we've wandered, we've really wandered away from from the book, but I think that's okay because we're reaching the end of the the interview here. Um, so the next question, I guess this is somewhat partly answered already, but if our listeners wanted to read more books along the lines of uh, Raised by Wolves, where would you direct? I don't know. I mean. I don't know any book that has the same kind of organizational structure where you alternate translations with conversations between a poet and translator. I think in, in that sense, it's, I mean, I may be wrong, but I think it's fairly unique. And I'd like to see more books like that. In fact, after the book came out, uh, a couple of translators wrote me and said they wanted to do the same thing with poets they're translating. Um, one of them was a translator, Jamie Proctor Chu. Uh, I think she's working on a volume. And, and she said, I'd really like to, to adopt that format. I'd really like to see different ways of of um you know presenting translations i mean if you think about something like scientific illustration for example you've got all sorts of ways in which people illustrate i mean there's the conventional illustration where you know somebody draws a a picture of a falcon for example and you know you can see what it looks like almost like a photograph or then but you've also got like conceptual and editorial illustrations that you know use creative imagery to tell a story or represent a topic that is difficult to portray literally then you have digital media where you know people you know do uh trans i mean they they create this uh, illustration partially or wholly by you know using software like uh, procreator and then you got the information graphics where which combine illustrations special effects sound narrative and i think my my volume is very much along the lines of informational graphics where you know we're combining uh, various meaning uh, media and it's a pity that we didn't have a QR code to to allow the reader to link up directly to uh, some of Amon's videos. I think that would have enriched the book, but maybe maybe if it ever gets reprinted, might do that. You also mm. have like technical illustrators. You know, do look, like for example, they they do these precise line work drawings that enable someone to design or assemble or repair or uh, you know understand what they're doing. And of course, you've got things like field sketches where you know people go out in the fields and they draw stuff from their, you know, the perspective of which they're looking at this uh, thing. And I wish translation had as rich, you know, uh, uh, a toolbox for representing Chinese poetry and translation. So I'm hoping that, you know, I mean, there are books out there that do something like what, what I've done, where they provide context for poems. David Hawkes has a wonderful uh, collection called A Primer to Dufu, in which he provides glosses and uh, prose commentary, but also straight translations of a dozen or so of Dufu's uh uh, best poems are the ones that are included in the 300 poems from the tongue. And then, yeah, there's uh, Florence Iskoff did a two volume collection of Dufu's poems in which she provided pretty much glosses for every single line and commentary for, and it was uh, a huge collection of two volume collection of Dufu's work. So I'm hoping that, you know, other, other translators will be inspired to come up with their own uh, and interestingly engaging, you know, formats for, for doing you know what I did, but right yeah. now I don't know any anyone that's doing quite what I did. Well, you've you've um, made me remember something you said earlier. Earlier, you dropped the phrase "global village," and I learned not so long ago the guy who coined that phrase is Marshall McLuhan, who's coined a more famous, possible well, maybe more famous phrase: uh, "medium is the message," which is a tricky one to interpret, but um, well, feels, actually, feels relevant here. Actually, what he said was the medium was the massage. Right. <laughs> and at most people, though, they understand it as a medium is the message. But in a sense, they're, they're kind of syn- the phrases are synonyms of each other. But the massage, meaning you're basically, you know, you're not just the, the medium is not just uh, what you're looking at, but it's massaging you. And in a sense, it's stultifying, not stultifying you. It's uh, lulling you to sleep, I think is 
probably what he meant by that, although I'm not real quite sure. It is a very open-ended phrase. It's been a long time since I've read McClue, and I, I may have forgotten the context in which it was written. Yes, I guess we could have gone down a whole a whole rabbit hole there about um, different mediums for delivering poetry, but maybe we can save that for next time. I guess for for me, if I would direct listeners anywhere, um, podcast listeners could certainly look to another book that the publisher, um, Phoneme, who've since been acquired by Deep Vellum, but I believe it's the same uh, same team or same people. Uh, they've got an, at least one other book of translated from Chinese poetry out there that I covered really early on in my podcast, uh, The Wild Great Wall by Zhu Zhu, uh, which has, it doesn't have a, a dialogue between himself and the author, Dong Li. I think there is an intro from Dong Li, but the relationship of the of the, the yeah the the poet and the translator has a similar sort of backstory where they met possibly also in Vermont but certainly at some sort of a a, a workshop or an institute or a place sort of designed for them to have some meeting or collaboration. I'm pretty uh, sure it was yeah. the Vermont Studio Center. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, a commonality there. I think I I got the impression. Juju and Amang have very different personalities. Um, may, although maybe there is some commonality, like a lone wolf thing. But yeah, uh, that that's a good one for listeners because you've not only got a book to go enjoy, there's an episode with the translator you can enjoy as well. So that's where I would point listeners. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I completely forgot about it. Yeah. Right. That's a good example. Mm-hmm. Okay, and our final question, what are you reading just now? What am I reading? Um, well, in... in in English, I, I, in the middle of Macbeth, which I'm reading for the MT time because, uh, you know, the, the Denzel Washington version came out and I wanted to be oh, able yeah. to compare the two. I'm a big Shakespeare fan. And uh, so that's, uh, and then I'm reading this wonderful book called uh, The Undressed Art, Why We Draw by the naturalist Peter Steinhardt, whose who's, uh, uh, his hobby is, is life drawing. And that's my hobby as well. I mean, I quit my job in 2015 and came back to Florida so I could get back to art. And in fact, I have a big solo show, the first show they've had in two years at the Santa Fe College here in uh, North Central Florida, where I live. And it's, a, a, it's basically a kind of anthropological study of the whole phenomenon of life drawing, its history, the, you know, the, the culture, the economics, the uh, life drawing scene from the point of view of the model as well as uh, the artists and uh, the history of life drawing and perspective and what, you know, and seeing and, um, you know, the difference between children's drawing and adults drawing. It's just an absolutely fascinating book. And I'm reading it too. I think it's for the fourth time. Uh, Chinese-wise, I'm reading uh, two things. One is I'm reading this uh, commentary published by the uh, Sanmin uh, Shuju uh, in Taiwan. It's a it's an annotated commentary and translation into modern Mandarin of the Yi Jing, you know, the classic Book of Changes. Because right. um, I decided this year, I decided in January, it's one of my New Year's resolutions that I would memorize all the the hexagrams, the sixty-four hexagrams oh. in here, and some of my favorite favorite phrases from the book uh i'm not i don't believe in di- in divination you know i don't read it for uh you know to find out what's going to happen this afternoon or whether or not i should do something but i i use it much like i use journaling when i'm faced with a difficult question i'll throw the coins and it'll lead me to a hexagram and i'll read that as a way of helping me to think through my own ambivalence or or, or contradictory uh, you know uh, response to some difficult question and uh so I decided I would do that. And it's really been great because I think you know, one of the other problems for, I think, American translators is not only that they don't have this, many of them don't have an auditory imagination because they, didn't, they don't have a childhood in the language and culture, but because they rely so heavily on Western sources rather than going to Chinese commentaries. Uh, Chinese commentaries, especially for anything in the classics, you know, are really excellent, uh, very thorough. And uh, I wish more scholars, Chinese scholars, would actually read that stuff instead of just reading each other's work. Uh, and then um, um, I just started this collection by uh, a Taiwanese uh, uh, cultural critic and essayist named uh, Long Ying Tai, and the collection is called Mu Song, which means Mu Song is, how do you translate that? It's like when you follow somebody with your eyes, when they depart, let's say you're gazing after, watching somebody go, oh. uh, you know, like she gazed affectionately after somebody as they walked away. And that's the title of the collection of these essays. And I'm doing that because I got invited to be a mentor in the American Literary Translator Association's Emerging Translator 
uh, mentorship program, and I'm uh, in charge of the uh, Taiwanese track, because the Taiwanese Ministry of Culture has given them some money to um, to you know pay the pay the mentee, you know, some emerging translator and me, and we'll meet in Alta at Alta Tucson in the fall. And uh, she's a wonderful, they're just a really brilliant kid. She's an undergraduate at Princeton named Sandra Chung. Uh, she's a comparative literature major, I think. Uh, it's um, pursuing certificates in I think humanities studies, translation, and uh, uh, intercultural communication. Uh, she's really smart as a whip, uh, perfectly bilingual. But you know, like most people, most emerging translators, she could use a few tips from somebody who's been around the block. And you know, I've been around the block a couple times. So I'm reading those the the, the collection of of her essays, and that's uh, really really quite engaging. Lu Tai was not only um, uh, you know uh, uh, she's still around, not only a great essayist, a very popular one. But she was also head of the Ministry of Culture for a couple of years when I was there. And I think I actually met her once at a cocktail party, but I, I'm, I'm not sure. It's not always easy to remember cocktail parties. Yeah, I remember what I was drinking, but I, there were too many people there to remember who I met. Yeah, I, I can relate. Sometimes the past is just <laughs> inextractable from all the other past it's buried under. I guess that is me totally out of questions. So thank you for answering all of them. Thank you for pushing back when necessary, just like I'm sure Amang would have that, that felt appropriate. But most importantly, just thank you for your time and all your thoughts. So yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Angus. I look forward to um, listening to the program and also following your, your podcast. I've become a fan now. Excellent. All right. We're nearly at the end now. Thank you again to Stephen for coming on and having such a spirited conversation. Thank you to Phoneme and Deep Vellum the publishers behind this book for setting up the whole thing it did take us a while to get there but as i just said we got there so it was all worth it i think it was, and it was nice to just have a chance to read the thing as well as to talk about it it was like i said in the interview a great read on the train if if you're gonna if you're looking for anything to read on the train i recommend raised by wolves i don't know why it just worked I guess I'll rattle off the plugs, then I will leave you you guys alone to go about your days. So the big plug I want to push today is the Patreon. Uh, I don't just put the the bonus questions up there. You, you may know that I record ha about half hour, sometimes 50 minutes, sometimes 45 minute solo thoughts on what I've been reading up on there. Basically, if it's anything China related, be it translated Chinese lit, nonfiction, whatever, Maybe it's not translated at all. Maybe it's written in English by, who knows, a diaspora person or an academic writing on China, whatever. If I read it and it's relevant, I, I, put, it, I put it up there. If I watch a Chinese movie, uh, I talk about it for about half an hour and put it up there. There are more episodes on the bonus feed than there are on the main feed. It has tallied up to must be hundreds of hours of content by now, and I keep making new stuff. Often, uh, I would say probably, yeah, more regularly than the main feed. You're getting a new thing up there every two or three weeks, sometimes every week. Uh, I just, I keep on adding it. It's uh, $1 a month to get access to all those goodies, and you'll be helping to support the show. So you'll be, you'll be, you'll have carved out a little hole inside my soul, and you'll be living there. Sorry, I'm not sure why I said such a weird and creepy thing, but oh well, it's it's been committed to the microphone now. I have no audio editing capabilities. I can't possibly remove it. It's there forever now. Nothing I can do. But yeah, that that's the Patreon. That's the elevator pitch. It's not really an elevator pitch, is it? I took ages. But that's my sales pitch for it. What can you do relating to the show that doesn't involve giving me money? Lots, in fact. You can give feedback or just follow for updates via social media. We've got a Discord channel. Uh, there's a link for that to join that in the show notes. There's also links to the Instagram, which is at trichrfic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Angus Likes Words. I sometimes tweet interesting things. Uh, often I'm just retweeting stuff that I'm going to use in the new segments, to be honest. Uh, the Instagram is probably more interesting. Again, if I'm being honest. What else can I say? Oh yes, the most important thing. The best thing you can do for the show, that's spread the word. So tell your mum, tell your dad, tell the wolf running down the mountain coming to take your fish. Tell the... Yeah, tell the translator who you are locked in a sort of logical, literary scrap to the death over the most sexy possible way to translate the word trash. Tell that translator and put him in his place. <laughs> and until you've done that, Zai Jian. <laughs>